worrying and start living. By Dale Carnegie. Part 5 The Golden Rule for Conquering Worry Chapter 19 How My Mother and Father Conquered Worry As I have said, I was born and brought up on a Missouri farm. Like most farmers of that day, my parents had pretty hard scratching. My mother had been a country schoolteacher and my father had been a farmhand working for $12 a month. Mother made not only my clothes, but also the soap with which we washed our clothes. We rarely had any cash except once a year when we sold our hogs. We traded our butter and eggs at the grocery store for flour, sugar, coffee. When I was 12 years old, I didn't have as much as 50 cents a year to spend on myself. I can still remember the day we went to a 4th of July celebration and father gave me 10 cents to spend as I wished. I felt the wealth of the Indies was mine. I walked a mile to attend a one-room country school. I walked when the snow was deep and the thermometer shivered around 28 degrees below zero. Until I was 14, I never had any rubbers or overshoes. During the long, cold winters, my feet were always wet and cold. As a child I never dreamed that anyone had dry, warm feet during the winter. My parents slaved 16 hours a day, yet we constantly were oppressed by debts and harassed by hard luck. One of my earliest memories is watching the flood waters of the 102 river rolling over our corn and hayfields, destroying everything. The floods destroyed our crops six years out of seven. Year after year, our hogs died of cholera and we burned them. I can close my eyes now and recall the pungent odor of burning hog flesh. One year, the floods didn't come. We raised a bumper corn crop, bought feed cattle, and fattened them with our corn. But the floods might just as well have drowned our corn that year, for the price of fat cattle fell on the Chicago market. And after feeding and fattening the cattle, we got only $30 more for them than what we had paid for them. $30 for a whole year's work. No matter what we did, we lost money. I can still remember the mule colts that my father bought. We fed them for three years, hired men to break them, then shipped them to Memphis, Tennessee and sold them for less than what we had paid for them three years previously. After ten years of hard, grueling work, we were not only penniless. We were heavily in debt. Our farm was mortgaged. Try as hard as we might, we couldn't even pay the interest on the mortgage. The bank that held the mortgage abused and insulted my father and threatened to take his farm away from him. Father was 47 years old. After more than 30 years of hard work, he had nothing but debts and humiliation. It was more than he could take. He worried. His health broke. He had no desire for food. In spite of the hard physical work he was doing in the field all day, he had to take medicine to give him an appetite. He lost flesh. The doctor told my mother that he would be dead within six months. Father was so worried that he no longer wanted to live. I have often heard my mother say that when father went to the barn to feed the horses and milk the cows and didn't come back as soon as she expected, she would go out to the barn, fearing that she would find his body dangling from the end of a rope. One day as he returned home from Maryville, where the banker had threatened to foreclose the mortgage, he stopped his horses on a bridge crossing the 102 River, got off the wagon, and stood for a long time looking down at the water, debating with himself whether he should jump in and end it all. Years later, father told me that the only reason he didn't jump was because of my mother's deep, abiding, and joyous belief that if we loved God and kept his commandments everything would come out all right. Mother was right. Everything did come out all right in the end. Father lived 42 happy years longer, and died in 1941, at the age of 89. 
During all those years of struggle and heartache, my mother never worried. She took all her troubles to God in prayer. Every night before we went to bed, mother would read a chapter from the Bible. Frequently mother or father would read these comforting words of Jesus. In my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there ye may be also. Then we all knelt down before our chairs in that lonely Missouri farmhouse and prayed for God's love and protection. When William James was professor of philosophy at Harvard, he said, Of course, the sovereign cure for worry is religious faith. You don't have to go to Harvard to discover that. My mother found that out on a Missouri farm. Neither floods nor debts nor disaster could suppress her happy, radiant, and victorious spirit. I can still hear her singing as she worked. Peace, peace, wonderful peace, flowing down from the Father above, sweep over my spirit forever I pray in fathomless billows of love. My mother wanted me to devote my life to religious work. I thought seriously of becoming a foreign missionary. Then I went away to college. And gradually, as the years passed, a change came over me. I studied biology, science, philosophy, and comparative religions. I read books on how the Bible was written. I began to question many of its assertions. I began to doubt many of the narrow doctrines taught by the country preachers of that day. I was bewildered. Like Walt Whitman, I felt curious, abrupt questionings stir within me. I didn't know what to believe. I saw no purpose in life. I stopped praying. I became an agnostic. I believed that all life was planless and aimless. I believed that human beings had no more divine purpose than had the dinosaurs that roamed the earth 200 million years ago. I felt that someday the human race would perish just as the dinosaurs had. I knew that science taught that the sun was slowly cooling and that when its temperature fell even 10%, no form of life could exist on Earth. I sneered at the idea of a beneficent God who had created man in his own likeness. I believed that the billions upon billions of suns whirling through black, cold, lifeless space had been created by blind force. Maybe they had never been created at all. Maybe they existed forever just as time and space have always existed. Do I profess to know the answers to all these questions now? No. No man has ever been able to explain the mystery of the universe, the mystery of life. We are surrounded by mysteries. The operation of your body is a profound mystery. So is the electricity in your home. So is the flower in the crannied wall. So is the green grass outside your window. Charles F. Kettering, the guiding genius of General Motors Research Laboratories, has been giving Antioch College $30,000 a year out of his own pocket to try to discover why grass is green. He declares that if we knew how grass is able to transform sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide into food sugar, we could transform civilization. Even the operation of the engine in your car is a profound mystery. General Motors Research Laboratories have spent years of time and millions of dollars trying to find out how and why a spark in the cylinder sets off an explosion that makes your car run. And they don't know the answer. The fact that we don't understand the mysteries of our bodies or electricity or a gas engine doesn't keep us from using and enjoying them. The fact that I don't understand the mysteries of prayer and religion no longer keeps me from enjoying the richer, happier life that religion brings. At long last, I realize the wisdom of Santayana's words. Man is not made to understand life, but to live it. I have gone back well, I was about to say that I had gone back to religion. But that would not be accurate. I have gone forward to a new concept of religion. I no longer have the faintest interest in the differences in creeds that divide the churches. 
but I am tremendously interested in what religion does for me, just as I am interested in what electricity and good food and water do for me. They help me to lead a richer, fuller, happier life. But religion does far more than that. It brings me spiritual values. It gives me, as William James puts it, a new zest for life, more life, a larger, richer, more satisfying life. It gives me faith, hope, and courage. It banishes tensions, anxieties, fears, and worries. It gives purpose to my life and direction. It vastly improves my happiness. It gives me abounding health. It helps me to create for myself an oasis of peace amidst the whirling sands of life. Francis Bacon was right when he said, 350 years ago. A little philosophy inclines man's mind to atheism. But depth in philosophy bringeth men's minds about to religion. I can remember the days when people talked about the conflict between science and religion. But no more. The newest of all sciences psychiatry is teaching what Jesus taught. Why? Because psychiatrists realize that prayer and a strong religious faith will banish the worries, the anxieties, the strains and fears that cause more than half of all our ills. They know, as one of their leaders, drive. A. A. Brill said. Anyone who is truly religious does not develop a neurosis. If religion isn't true, then life is meaningless. It is a tragic farce. I interviewed Henry Ford a few years prior to his death. Before I met him, I had expected him to show the strains of the long years he had spent in building up and managing one of the world's greatest businesses. So I was surprised to how calm and well and peaceful he looked at 78. When I asked him if he ever worried, he replied, No. I believe God is managing affairs and that he doesn't need any advice from me. With God in charge, I believe that everything will work out for the best in the end. So what is there to worry about? Today, even psychiatrists are becoming modern evangelists. They are not urging us to lead religious lives to avoid hell fires in the next world. But they are urging us to lead religious lives to avoid the hell fires of this world, the hell fires of stomach ulcer, angina pectoris, nervous breakdowns, and insanity. As an example of what our psychologists and psychiatrists are teaching, read The Return to Religion, by Dr. Henry C. Link. You will probably find a copy in your public library. Yes, the Christian religion is an inspiring, health-giving activity. Jesus said, I came that ye might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus denounced and attacked the dry forms and, 